All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Let me add some folks to the stream. So we've got uh, Michael and Steve. Hello, hello. Hello. All right, and I'm going to try not to stare down at my screen the whole time. But hey, we're going to be uh, programming some LEDs today. So I typically do my office hour streams just kind of working on whatever I feel like. But uh, I've been talking to Michael and Steve about doing some embedded stuff, mostly on Twitter. So we figured it would make sense to uh, get together, hack on some blinky LEDs, and uh, have some fun. So I figure we'll go for about an hour, hour and a half, maybe two. And we'll just uh, chat about stuff while one of the three of us is... Uh, Hacking on some LEDs. Sweet. So, real yeah. quick, or let me let me hand it over to Michael. You, do you guys want to give introductions for folks who don't know you yet? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Michael. Uh, I work at a company called Camure, and so we do healthcare. And I get to use Rust, and I've been using it since 2015 when 1.0 came out. So. Uh, I know a lot about Rust, and I know literally nothing about embedded <laughs> programming in Rust. Uh, the most I know about it is the time I wrote the um, this one article where I had to like deep dive into the standard library to understand like how no core worked with no STD, and that's about it. That's all I know. And then Steve. Yeah, so hey everybody, I'm Steve. Uh, I recently joined a company called Ferris System. It's not Ferris System, Jesus. Sorry. Yes, game is a Ferris <laughs> System. So I've been talking with him a lot. Uh, I've joined this company called Oxide Computer, and I should not be talking about my job while I'm also trying to type a URL into my freaking editor. Anyway, at Oxide, we are building a basically a brand new computer, uh, and all the software on said hardware is in Rust. So I'm doing a lot of embedded Rust stuff um, because servers have way more than just the computers that run your code in them. And so uh, basically, yeah, been doing doing a bunch of work on that. Eventually it will be open source, but right now we're kind of like just heads down working and not talking a whole lot about the details. But uh, I've been new to, like I did embedded stuff in college a little bit because I had a class on it. Um, and uh, it's been a long time since I've done a bunch of that stuff. And so it's been really cool to like get back into it and learn all these things. And so I'm kind of like in the middle of these two where I have like some experience and been doing it for a little while, but not forever. So uh, it's kind of, we got a good like range of experiences. Cool. And then uh, I'm James. Uh, I work at a company called Ferris Systems, not Oxide Computers, uh, but we do a bunch of <laughs> Rust stuff uh, at systems level Rust programming. So we're a consultancy that does a bunch of training and assistance uh, and open source development and things like that. Um, and my background's been in embedded. So I've been doing embedded for a long time and been doing embedded Rust now for a long time, which is a surprising thing to say. Uh, but for today's stream, I wanted to show off a couple things. So I've been working with a lot of LEDs lately, so it seemed uh, well timed to work on some LEDs. And also Ferris has been working on some tools that make it easy to do embedded development. So I figured I'd show off some of those as well. Some of these uh, aren't, well, none of the tools that I'm going to show off are public today, but will be shortly. We're doing a kind of sponsor-driven um, open source project called Nerling RS, where the, the goal is to build a bunch of really cool open source tools for people to be able to work on embedded systems easier. So bin format, one of the tools that we're going to be using today is out of that Nerling RS repo. So if you're interested in what we're doing today, or if it looks cool, feel free to come check it out. We're doing GitHub sponsors for that. So I'll probably share a link at some point. But um, yeah, we're going to be doing some LEDs. So what I have hardware wise is we're going to be working on an NRF 52, which I have duct tape over here because uh, I'm not good at planning physical logistics. <laughs> and then we have a string of 30 smart LED RGB LEDs above me, which I have also duct taped what I thought was above my head, but turns out is it exactly the level of my headphone. So I keep hitting it with my head. So that'll probably be funny for the entire day. Um, but we're going to be writing code that controls these LEDs and we're just going to make cool patterns. Um, and yeah, I'm doing a let me bring everyone back and let me share my screen. So for all of today, I'll have the uh, code window up here on the main screen with our faces over on the side. Above me, you'll be able to see the real physical one. And once we hit run the first time, I'm gonna go ahead and hit run. Using that uh, debugging tool that I was talking about, bin format, I've got some uh, on-screen display going too. So if you can't exactly see what's going on over my head, you should be able to see the same thing up on the screen here. So. Hopefully it'll be visible for everyone. It'll be fun to play with. And uh, we'll probably talk about stuff. Uh, I've described this to the other two folks as 
uh, Alex Creighton at a uh, Rust Fest would always have just a giant Lego set, like a Saturn V rocket or the Death Star, because he knew that like while he was working on something. Uh, he couldn't work on something serious because people were always going to be asking questions and talking about stuff. So he would just build in a, a Lego so that uh, he had something low prio fun to work on while people could ask him questions. And I figure that's pretty much what we're going to do today. So I'll probably just hand the controls around the room and let someone try and build something. Um, and then we'll just talk about other stuff. But I'll go through the, uh, the code real quick to show Steve and Michael what we have going. Um, but we just have a really basic no standard embedded program here um it's not much more than kind of getting the peripherals so we have our main here um so we get the peripherals for our nrf 52. Um, i've gone ahead and set up the timer so we've got a microsecond precision timer that we can use here uh, we've got some gpios but pretty much all we're going to be carrying about is the one that's connected up to this led controller um, and we have a little library that's doing the control of these LEDs using the PWM peripheral. So this is all controlled by the hardware itself. Uh, we make a big grid of 30 LEDs. Um, we have bin format, which is our logger. So we're able, able to do things like logging over the console. So if you see stuff like this, this is coming out of bin format logging. So if you've seen like the logging create in Rust, it's going to work exactly the same. Um, and then we can do whatever we want. So what's up there on the code right now is it's basically just filling red in with like uh, some random-ish data. I was just doing some shenanigans here to make kind of like a pattern that looked kind of pretty. Um, and then we update the LEDs on our graph and then we update the LEDs on the real pixel. We wait five milliseconds, and then we just go around in this endless, endless loop. Um, so there's really actually not much more to it. So I'm actually going to hand it over. So Steve, you have a control of this, right? I do have. I'm. I'm like. I'm. I'm in it somewhere. I don't know. I don't oh, know what like you. actually controls versus not control. Like who is who's in charge? Um, so, I can definitely type stuff. We, yeah, we can so all you type, can type stuff. stuff. So I, we like all this stuff. I was hoping that you could all hit the run button, but I haven't quite figured out how to get the live share yeah. permissions the, to work so the host that does run not works. Allow running this command. That's what it says. Yeah. I was doing this with Michael to enable before. it. So clearly, I have to ask you. <laughs> we had yeah, the same. We I, were trying this out before the stream. We had the same yeah. issue. <laughs> I went through my permissions and gave you literally everything. So I'm pretty sure you can do some terrible stuff to my computer now, but <laughs> apparently not hit the run button. So. Uh, I guess I'll be in charge of. I could just get in there and turn on the permission myself. I guess. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess I'll be in charge of hitting the run button. I I don't say stud. I say standard usually. I think. I so, say STD. Yeah. Well, it's like we almost have the basically we all say it slightly differently. I I think I'll say like libstd, but I'll say like use standard whatever. Like I think it contextually shifts, which is maybe the worst possible uh, combination yeah. of all things. I definitely <laughs> rotate. I definitely say no stood sometimes, but when I'm in like presenter explain things, to, like when I'm in trainer mode, I'm like, it's no standard. But when I'm just talking on the internet, I'm like, it's no stood. Yeah. It's, it's uh -oh. kind of one of the more contentious uh, things at work is how do you pronounce um, the command line tool to like control Kubernetes? So it's oh, like, yeah. we've got, I'm, I'm in the Cubectal camp. Some people say cube, <laughs> I, yeah. Some people say cube CTL. Uh, I've also had cube cuddle. So. Yeah. <laughs> I had someone just, talking like, with her, like, uh, it was like someone whose name was Caitlin, and someone shortened her name to Kate's, like K A S, and yeah. then they just say Kate's. Um, they're like, but that means that my long name is Kubernevelin or something <laughs> like that. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, well, Steve, I'm uh, going to put yeah. you in charge of writing some code now. So what kind of a pattern do you want to make? I So one thing I thought was kind of fun, so like hilariously, uh, you know, there's tons of ways in which all this can go wrong. And I think that's kind of also <laughs> interesting. And so the first thing I saw that jumped out to me that was a thing that you did not mention, which is kind of fun, is this wrapping ad. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you don't do a wrapping ad, then you're going to hit like overflow and it's going to like blow up. And so I was actually thinking maybe instead of writing good code that makes things work, like <laughs> what if we just did this instead and like see what happens? Um, after well, I will all, say this we're whole... running in release mode, so it will actually still okay. do the same thing. It's still still do the same thing. That's a bummer. I guess this is because <sighs> do you actually check the? Well, let's see here. So how dare the compiler well, be smart enough? Wait. Is it going to? Uh, oh, it's because you only enumerate. Like it's because 
you don't actually use that CT to index into anything. No, it's just setting yeah. the red value of our uh, pixel. Totally. So all of the pixels are going through and it's taking the current count, which is rolling between zero and 255. So I should mention for each of our LEDs, each color can be between zero and 255. Um, Cause it's just an eight bit for each color. Um, so it's running through the count, which is just wrapping from zero to 255 modulus the um the index so like zero to 29 inclusive plus one so i don't actually do modulus zero which is the same thing as dividing by zero um so you'll see like the ones that are early in the stream uh like go through the pattern super quick so they're like flickering but the ones at the end are basically doing a slow ramp all the way up to 255 so this was just the fast updating pattern that i could come up with quickly to show off uh the graphic demo but totally. oh also I, I didn't mention we also have a random number generator so you can just get random rngs um and you can do like dot random u8 to get a random u8 um we can also keep whatever state we want and we can do like one of the things that i typically do is have some kind of state and you, like every loop iteration you pick the new color and you gradually fade to that new color over like 20 steps or something like that. So you could have a loop with a for loop inside of it so that you're like, okay, take the Delta, whether it's positive or negative, divide it by 20 steps and then just like walk each of the steps. And we do have a floating point unit on this board. Um, so we can do floating point math reasonably quick <laughs> if we'd like to, oh, no. um, but our, our pixels will still be 255. So we do have to like bring it back from a float into uh, a 255. I don't trust myself with floating point numbers. <laughs> yeah. So Steve, do you want to try, if you don't have anything yeah. else that you want to do, I'd say we should probably either try and do like the whole <clears throat> strip fading from like color to color to color, or we could do something like pick uh, seven colors and just kind of rotate them through here. Like if we wanted to rotate a rainbow through. In the Smart LEDs crate, there's also a, um, they have a module called uh, Colors. And then they have a bunch of colors in there where you can get like common colors. So you don't have to know the RGB code. So you can do stuff nice. like colors. It's got all of the like internet official cornflower blue. Yeah. So you can pick colors <laughs> like color. Um, so you can, it's the same type as this. So these are both RGB eight. So you can just say like pixel equals uh, color cornflower blue um so this will very boringly make all of our colors cornflower blue all of the time so now we see we have cornflower oh, blue oh yeah sweet that's awesome so steve i will uh, i'll give the yeah. reins over to you and i'll okay. probably ask uh michael while you're typing i'll try and talk to uh, michael a little bit about the his experience with embedded so you did mention and just yell at me if you want me to hit run um okay. So, how's uh, how's your experience with Embedded? You said you did some stuff in college? Uh, I mean, Steve did. I also did. I kind of forgot that I did that because <laughs> it was like this oh, okay. one. Like, I, uh, it was one class, um, and we were kind of learning, like, assembly and stuff. And so it was, like, mm -hmm. a lot more low level. Um, and it took me what all semester. What platform were you on for Embedded? Oh, God. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> this is, or it's been the, too long and you have no idea anymore oh no this is this is my this is my i have some horror stories <laughs> you've activated my trap card in that sense okay. um so back at my college we used to have these old sunblade computers in the back of like uh like one of these places and so um you would have to essentially like SSH into the com into the computer science department's like network onto like your one of the like Ubuntu machines in like the the lab, and then you would have to like SSH into another machine, and then this one you only had access to C shell. You didn't even like ZSH didn't exist, Bash didn't exist on this thing. I mean, this thing was just like old stuff. And then right. what you had to do was that you then had to um, basically do some stuff to like send instructions and whatever code you had written into the sun blades so that it would run. Um, okay. And then you would like use a remote GDB session in order to like talk to it and to like do <laughs> stuff to it. And then 
it could sometimes get into a state where it would like break or something. Um, so you would send like a restart command, and what it would do is that apparently. I never saw it, but I, I had heard that what would happen was that there'd be like some kind of like motor actuator that would like press the restart button on the <laughs> on the actual machine and then restart the whole thing. And then you could like actually like go and do stuff. Hit run. Hit run. I'm on it. Uh but yeah, so um it it was that was about wow. oh no, uh flashing well, is- slashing light warning. That is, yeah, that's that's random for sure. Maybe oh, maybe yeah. pausing that is okay at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully it won't be too, it'll only be a couple of pixels. So your whole screen won't be flashing. But if someone's sensitive enough for a little bit of LED above me or on the screen, then then heads up on that. We may accidentally make it go way too fast. Yeah. Also, our update rate is five milliseconds. So it's going to be updating something like 200 times a second right now. But you can change that as well. Yeah, that might be a good thing to change too. Yeah. And I did realize I can follow you. So now it's going to just follow you. So I'm on autopilot. So I don't have to actually like scroll around to see what you're doing. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it was, it was like fighting me to some degree. Like now when I try to go up, it's like, oh, is it? Uh, a little bit. So let me uh, unfollow participant and then follow participant. Maybe it'll go back into neutral on my side. Turn it off and on again. It should always work. Uh, Yeah. Or is it still? It's still being okay, a little not, weird, but I don't totally know. It was doing it before you, you did the follow, I think. So I'm uh, okay. not sure. Yeah, I can see it on mine as well. Whenever it like moves you up and down, it's really weird. It happens. Oh yeah, computers. So I've got a couple of questions. Yeah, definitely. I've had remote hardware before, and that's always fun to deal with. And I've I've definitely seen that's like up there with the like. I've heard the apocryphal story of someone who had like a CD drive that was faced at some other computer's power button. So like to restart the other computer, you could eject the CD drive on one computer and it would press the button and then you'd you'd like reinsert the, the drive. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it it was, it was, yeah. So it was like that. And then like we had an assembly class and then, um, then we also did some stuff with like Arduinos as well. Mm. Um, That was like about the most embedded that I had done. Um, and then, like again, we use that horrific machine for like our operating systems class, and mm-hmm. I never got the mutex to work because it was just a pain of trying to get C headers to compile, and then I had to do it on that machine, and it didn't work with my workflow. It was just it was a very frustrating experience overall. <laughs> nice. So I'm gonna we got a couple questions in there. So someone's asking how my lighting is set up, and wonder if the LEDs would show up better if your lighting was a bit darker. Probably. Um, I'm facing a window and I don't have any curtains on this window. So unfortunately there is until the sun goes down, there's nothing I can do to get this. So I think in the future, maybe we'll start later. So it's dark in Berlin so that you can actually see that. But then we'd have the opposite problem in that this would blow my face out because like these LEDs are so bright and like, (laughs) it's super hard to get high dynamic range for LEDs and like human lighting. I guess if I had a spotlight on my face to go with it, but that's why I did the on-screen display is because I knew viewing my face and the LEDs at the same time on the same camera would be terrible. Um, so sorry about that, but hopefully the the on-screen display helps a bit with that. Um, someone's asking if the colors have brick red. Yes, it does have brick red. I know I have seen that before. Can I have um, one again what, for me real quick? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we're, we're very black and white flashy. Yes slowed it Ooh. down and added a bunch of numbers so that it, in theory makes it like yeah, <laughs> or whatever um so it reminds me of uh tv static yeah yeah um someone's saying what do they s- use to see the leds on the pc and not having to send the firmware to the discovery board so we are sending the firmware to the um the device this is using um, it's not a discovery yeah, thing. it's an NRF52, so similar dev board, but it's with a Nordic chip instead of an STM chip. Um, it is sending it over a debugger, so it is actually flashing this hardware device that's slightly off screen here. So we are using real physical hardware here, um, and it's connected to these LEDs. Uh, what we use to see it on the screen is a tool from Fair Systems called Bin Format, which is currently in early preview. So sponsors of the Nerling RS organization. Um, get access to this tool, and I'm using that to build some visualization stuff. Eventually, we're going to build, or we're planning on building an IDE integration, so you could have a plugin for VS Code that would just do all kinds of either graphing or displaying LEDs or displaying state machines and stuff right like that. 
Right now I've prototyped it with GG Easy in Rust. So I'm doing the visualizations myself, but the plan is to eventually make this kind of like a side panel IDE experience for VS Code. So right now VS Code's all automating the flashing of this, getting the logs, showing the backtrace and then displaying, but it's kicking that out to another process that's actually doing the, the uh, displays. That's cool. Do you want me to hit run, Steve? Yeah, hit run again real quick. I'm trying out uh, Elliot's suggestion about... Brick red? No, just like I dampered it. So it's like basically modulus yeah. 32 instead. Um, but uh, So it is it's, flashing. It's hard to see. It's just I like think hard if I do this, you can kind of see the it. details because it's super dark. Oh, yeah, I can see it. Go, let me go hero mode on me and you can, you can see the LEDs flashing a little bit when I put some shade on it. Yeah. But... Yeah, they're not super, super bright. Yeah, so Ryan asked about formatting code and binary sizes and what Neuralink does. So I know a little bit of the first part, but not the latter part. So I don't know if you want to address all of that question or not, James, or if you want to like sure talk about it together yeah. or whatever i don't know yeah we we're going to have a blog post coming out this week but bin format is actually a really cool tool because one of the problems on embedded is that formatting is a fairly large code size thing and it's relatively slow so even if you have a fast like logging transport the problem is it takes a relatively long time to do all kinds of formatting and things like the debug formatting um that's provided like derived debug is actually fairly big. Like on a desktop, it's not so bad because it's a couple of kilobytes, but when you only have 64 kilobytes of total code space, then a couple of those add up pretty quickly. Um, bin format is a cool tool that does this way more efficiently by not doing it. Um, and that's really the <laughs> trick. Is the, the best way to go faster is to do less. Yeah. Um, so bin format is a cool tool that was kind of um, Jorge or Japarik has been working on this for a long time. And lately we've been putting some more Ferris folks on it to kind of get it ready for a first release. But what it does is it kind of memoizes all of these uh, logging messages. So for example, when we send this info, instead of actually formatting this, um, at compile time, we go, oh, this is just a fixed string. So we give it an index. And then when we actually do the logging, instead of sending the full restart string from the device to the host, we just say, this is logging index 12. And so we only send one byte that, or we, there's a little bit of a header in there too, but we basically just send one byte that just says here, which means that the uh, code didn't have to do any formatting and we have to send it. And even if we were to do something like restart um, count. So this looks like it's formatting, but what this actually does is it says, uh, if I do something like U8, so we say this is a U8 that we're formatting. And I know this is a little bit different than Russ's formatting syntax, but what this says is- Okay, we I, was have I was like, oh, why didn't- I was Yeah, like, we have restart. Colon? and a U8. So this will get a new ID. This will be like ID number 13. And what it says is it sends over the wire format 13 and then the value of count. And since count is a U8, it basically just sends one byte for the string part and then one byte, which is the actual value of count. And that gets reassembled on the host side. So the host side does all the formatting instead of your embedded system, which means that like, not only do you not have any code or any CPU time wasted uh, formatting, you also like, can send it over the wire. Oops, why are we getting a... Uh... Oh, haha. Oh, well, so, okay, I was like, I was like, oh, is this part of the syntax? It's a colon? No, it's a... <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is this. The, the different okay. syntax is this U8, so we use the type as a format specifier, essentially. Gotcha. Um, cool. The nice thing is you can format, like, 9, 10, 20 things, and it will do all of that. So you can see, well, like, as it's doing... Well, I guess she, Steve's changed the program, so it's no longer... Oh, there it goes. I guess it's probably not incrementing count anymore, but you can see it's actually logging this. Uh, right now we have this designed for embedded systems, but we do actually want to, uh, we're working on also making this work for things like server side systems, because then you can have like really silly efficient logging and tracing because you're doing no formatting at all. And you basically just condense this down to the uh, like bare, it's like almost like serializing, but even cheaper because you're just shoving the bytes on the wire and letting the log parser handle all of the hard work. Um, so right now this is using a technology called RTT, which goes through the debugger, which is pretty quick. Um, later, we're gonna add support for another logging infrastructure called ITM, which is even faster. So you can get things like sustained 32 megabits per second 
out of the debugger with very, very little overhead to the actual CPU because it's all hardware doing the debugging itself. So you can just like be blindly having the hardware shove stuff in there in real time without slowing down your actual program. So even though we're updating these LEDs in real time, it doesn't slow any of that down. Um, oh, so that's cool. Yeah, this is one of those like get the desktop experience and get the desktop experience on embedded systems. And it feels like we're not even flashing the code, but this is actually all running on the embedded system itself. Yeah, and I think that's also an important thing to call out too. That's like one of the ways in which embedded ends up being different from other kinds of development that mm. if you're not from the embedded world, you may not fully appreciate, which is I was like, why do I need like, you know, you think about a debugger, you're like, okay, it's software that like inspects memory and prints stuff out and like steps. Why do I need like hardware support for a debugger? And so then you realize it's like, oh yeah, it's cause like these chips are not powerful, but my computer is powerful. So I want a way yeah. to like, okay, offload the work from the actual thing to something that's like designed to make that work. And like sorting that out was, was definitely a, uh, you know, a trick. And then also to like the difference between like semi-hosting versus like not semi-hosting for these kinds of things, because at first, you, you know, so basically like there's a semi-hosting thing and the Cortex M8 crate gives you this thing that's basically like so real LN. So yeah, you're okay. just like, hello. And, uh, you know, then this like ends up printing out hello in your debugger if you have semi-hosting on. So you're like, why would I, why would I not do that? And it's like, well, what this actually does is it like pauses the CPU and then like prints all this stuff to you and then turns it back on, which means you can have like interesting race conditions. So I was writing an interrupt handler and oh. all my code was totally working and everything was fine. And I was like, awesome, I'm gonna remove my debug prints and then uh, I'll ship this code. And then I remove the debug prints and then it broke. And I was like, mm. what is going on? And it's because <laughs> it's literally like stopping and starting time in like one part of the computer, but not the rest. And so what I was happening is I was obscuring a race condition where I was getting a spurious interrupt uh, mm. because it was paused to print. And so what I needed to do was like handle the spurious interrupt by just ignoring it. But because I was like <clears throat> pausing to print stuff out, the real interrupt would arrive. And so it was like obscuring that the spurious one was happening. Like, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah. So Gray oh, in the comments was saying, this is bringing uh, classic print line debugging to embedded. And that's actually a really good point. Cause like, this is something that Jorge said when he came up with it is because debugging with something like GDB is great for post-mortem because you essentially mm -hmm. stop the world and you can start stepping. But if you're in the middle of doing anything like a network stack or a USB stack or something like that, you're toast. Like you've just lost your connection because you you basically the other you basically hung up on the other side. Yeah. Um, so something like this for like real time tracing is really important because you can actually see stuff in situ without interrupting what's actually <clears throat> going on, which is like people kind of are like, oh, why aren't you using a debugger and why are you using printing or, or logging? But I mean, there's just some stuff that you can't really stop the world to debug, especially oops. Especially in embedded, I'm kind of reminded of James Mickens' The Night Watch uh, article, yeah. where he's like, "I can't debug my tools because I broke my tools with my tools." Like, <laughs> like once, once exactly. you don't have a network stack, like, how are you going to get anything out of it? Yeah, and I mean, honestly, like print line debugging is what I do for the most part. Um, even though even our work code base is like a gigantic amount of lines of code, and it's like hundreds of thousands of lines of Rust code, and you know, we get to, I, I still use print line debugging because just the debugger experience on Rust is like, honestly, not that great. And mm -hmm. if you're also on OS X, just forget it. <laughs> like, yeah. GDB is not a thing you can use and LLDB is a bit subpar. So well, it's kind of really in and start medic, making yeah. some stuff, but I'd, I'd love to hear uh, a little bit of Steve's, what Steve's been working on at Oxide. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll do the, I'll do the typing while others do the talking now. The short of it is basically like uh, the thing I'm currently working on at work is a little operating system. Uh, and so for, because like, we're gonna have all these chips in the computer and some of them, you know, need to like, some of them are <laughs> the ones that will run the actual workload that you'll end up doing and other ones are things that like manage this, the rack and stuff like that. And so those are effectively embedded systems inside of your rack of servers. And so, you know, you want a little OS to, uh, you know, do OSE kind of things. And so mostly been working on that and eventually it will be open source, but for now is entirely closed because it's just too, way too early to like, um, you know, open things up. It's not actually useful um, because it's not done enough yet to like bother basically. So I've been doing a bunch of that, which uh, is pretty cool. And so it's largely just like, you know, yeah, like pick a peripheral that we haven't written a driver for yet and like write a driver. So 
Um, I, I recently did like an I2C driver where we had our I2C driver was just like polling and I turned it in interrupt based and that's when the interrupt handler thing went off and just like kind of working on that sort of stuff basically. So um, it's been pretty cool to get back into that kind of work. Uh, on my personal side, I've been trying to re-implement uh, um, preemptive scheduling um, because like that code it like works and is everywhere, but it's like always something that I have like not personally done myself. And so I have the like, it's, it's funny because this definitive guide to the Cortex M like book, basically it's just like describes it, like it's big and thick, like there's a lot in there and it actually has sample code for the thing I'm trying to do, but it's in C. And so I'm like porting it to Rust, and then it's not working. And I'm like, oh no, what am I misunderstanding about the semantics between the C code and the Rust code? Because the C code does things like, instead of indexing into an array, it casts the array to a pointer and then does math on it. Oh and no. So I'm just like, I don't want to do it that way. I want to just like index in the array nicely. And so then I've messed something up or whatever. So I've also been doing a lot of like, okay this line makes my CPU just like blow up. Like why, what, what am I messing up before, uh, you know, this actually happens? Oh, that's cool. Oh, neat. Figured we get some rotating rainbow pattern. So it's just walking through the, the nice thing is we can still use things like iterators. So I just made like a red, orange, yellow, and just an, uh, use cycle to just make it go on forever. <clears throat> I'm sure I could like zip together these iterators or so. Oh, I'm gonna do totally. that because yeah, that's cool though, because it is something too that's like definitely like, are like there was a thread on the 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 Rust subreddit yesterday where someone was like, oh, but you know what do what do I do about memory allocation blowing up in Rust by default? Like the fact that you can't check allocations. Like what do the embedded people do? And I was like, I don't ever allocate, uh, but like I forget sometimes <laughs> because it turns out that like so many features in Rust don't require allocation that it's yep. like actually really. Like the fact that you can do all this iterator shenanigans and like not have to worry about any of that stuff means that it's like actually really nice. Like I actually don't miss dynamically allocating memory like ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, um, like like normally you only have to you only there's only a few iterator things that like actually allocate. It's like collect and like a few other ones, but yeah. Uh, so GeoXen, if I'm probably butchering that. Sorry, it's always hard you see stuff. Uh, yeah, I definitely do find that I would debug less because Rust checks everything. Like that's true in general. The stuff that I'm doing is like super unsafe, so that's when it becomes useful. But uh, is when you're like starting to directly mess with things, and sometimes when you're not sure that the high level interface you're doing is actually doing the thing that it's supposed to be doing. Like you know, I I wanted to I was doing something where I was using this high level interface that's like take this enum, set these three options, and then write it out to a register. And like I knew the final value that needed to be written out to a register was like three. But uh, the interface did not have just like, well, it did, but I didn't see it at first. They just like write a three to this register. So I want to like verify that the thing was actually writing the right value and I wasn't like missing the wrong options or setting that up or whatever. And so those kind of things are definitely still useful to like double check sometimes you're like, okay, this should compile down to a, like put a three here. Um, does it actually do that or not? And that's when that's useful. Um, Alan, uh, it is it is for ARM um, specifically at the moment. Um, yeah, kind of like a couple of different ARM chips, but um, purely ARM stuff. Um, that's not to say that like you should make any assumptions about Oxide's eventual product line because as I said, this is sort of for like the ancillary parts of stuff where, you know, like inside of a server, there's a lot of other computers doing a lot of different things. And so uh, that doesn't mean that the servers are ARM servers. It just means there is an ARM chip somewhere inside of those servers. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about the product ends up looking like just there are some embedded systems work going on in there. Sick. Let me, if... Uh, and then Steve, are you ever gonna write like a arm the the good parts? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just, honestly, just like coming from X eighty six, it's almost all the good parts. Honestly, oh, like, that's great. X, like it's <laughs> like. Okay, as an example of the kinds of things that ARM has done, like I'm actually really like super psyched that ARM is doing so well because it just like all their stuff seems to make way more sense. Like basically, 
So for example, um, they defined the, the like ABI of interrupts to be such that you can just write functions to be interrupt handlers because the hardware pushes the like caller saved registers uh itself so you, like when i was writing my little like os on x86 i like write an interrupt handler like rust has some functions now that you can like just ask lvm to do it but at the time it was like write inline assembly to like do this preamble and postamble and kind of like make that happen Whereas ARM is just like, that's kind of basically dumb. Like, why not make the hard, if it has to happen in order for this to be valid, just like make the hardware do it automatically so you can just like write a regular function. And so what you end up writing when you're writing these like interrupt handlers is basically just, yeah, please call this function whenever an interrupt happens and it like just works. So that's like one example of how just like things are way nicer in general. There's just like a lot less shenanigans, it seems like. And some of that obviously is because x86 has a ton of legacy and there's like other reasons why, you know, like you do things in certain ways or whatever. But I'm just, I, as somebody who's not really done any ARM stuff until relatively recently, it just feels a lot cleaner in general to me. And that's like been pretty nice. Um, so I've definitely, I don't think that the good parts is definitely like strictly needed, uh, but maybe, you know, after I've been doing this a little bit longer, maybe I'll get there. Um, also, I'm finally, gl I'm really glad that you finally got your shirt. I really love it. So yeah, much. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I did finally get it yesterday. It's good. Oh, I'm attempting to do that. ridiculous iterator things now. I'm trying to just make it like move over, but I think I'm not doing it right. So <laughs> I was trying to just get it to like scroll over, but I, I think I've managed to make it uh make it too complicated. So Michael, you wanna you wanna take a crack at this? Yeah, I think I'm going to try and is there like a way to get it to like have the light be like brighter and then like not as bright? Yeah, so for that, you just need to apply a color value. Like it's just the level of brightness is just like the amount of color. So like 255 would be the brightest and zero would be the darkest. So you can do all kinds of things. So you could like um, like if you took a color and you wanted to do a fade or something like that. You could like multiple. You could take the number, make it a float thirty-two, divide by two fifty-five to get like a zero to one normalized. Apply a scaling factor to it, and then take it back down to two fifty-five or something like that. So like you can do whatever you want. But you just need to send a color for R, G, and B that's uh, between zero and two fifty-five for each channel. Okay, cool. I'm gonna try and get it to do like a bit of a wave pattern with like blue okay. or something, and kind of scroll across. But we'll see how well that goes. <laughs> nice. Yeah, this is one of those one of those things where it's just LEDs are one of those things that I go to to make me feel uh, better about embedded development because like a lot of times I'll be building like really low level or complex stuff, which like is really helpful, but it takes like weeks to pay off sometimes and like when it works you're like yeah it, it works like it's boring because it just works so there's a lot of stuff like whenever i'm getting like i don't know like frustrated at like ah uh, embedded systems are like hard to see the impact of and stuff like that i just go and blink leds for a while like i pulled out i have this big led ring and i just made a clock on it and just made it do like fancy little patterns over and over and over on the clock and it's just so like immediate satisfaction. I can understand why like folks who do, I imagine people who do like front end dev have the same feeling that I do when I do embedded stuff of like, you can make a change, see the change. And you're like, this is immediate reward for the kind of stuff that I'm building versus like a lot of the times in embedded, if you're doing like an interrupt driver for a serial port, you're like, oh, I got a packet. Cool. Like, but there's no like real immediate visual reward or anything for that. So like LEDs are always my go-to whenever I'm feeling bummed about like, or not productive about stuff. Cause you can make stuff happen pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah, it's definitely. And also the other nice thing about LEDs is like, they don't require any of that super big CPU time or whatever. So if you're like yeah. at the pre-stage before you're even getting anything working at all, like it's nice to have, like, this is a great it's in work chat usually someone was like oh yeah i was making this board for fun and over the weekend and then like i got it in the mail and i realized i left off the leds and everyone was like oh no and i was like <laughs> i get why that sounds funny as a joke but like if you'd say a little more about like why that's like actually it sounds like this is more serious and not just a joke thing and like, oh yeah because like you know the first time you get a new board like it's like a thing i invented and so i don't know that anything works so like having a very minimal thing to be able to get it going is like actually useful to make sure that like you know because you just don't know if other 
whether things are broken or what's going on. So like, yeah. Yeah, I've said it at conferences before, but blinking LED is essentially hello world for embedded systems. And like you said, the board bring up process where you like, someone designed the hardware and they send it to you. And then they're like, it's supposed to work. Make make software happen, software person. Yeah. And then for like the first couple of weeks, it's like, is my software wrong or is the hardware wrong? And not yeah. having any sort of like source of truth for that is always super frustrating. And like, you really do just have to like chop it up one piece by one piece. Like, can I get the CP? Can I flash code to it? Because that's usually yeah. like the first or first one is usually like when I plug it in, does it light on fire? Because yeah. I've had boards <laughs> like that, that like you plug them in. And immediately, like, a component explodes or something like that. Because you're like, oops, Ooh. turns out uh, the 5-volt rail was accidentally connected to the 0-volt rail, which means you just dumped, like, 2 amps of current through this little resistor, which then immediately blew up. Like, Oof. it's like a fuse. You didn't intend to be a fuse. Can we try running this? I have no idea if it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, It compiles. Well, it compiles. I saw it. I see no colors though, so uh, it's making my debugger very sad. Are you? It do says you... CT is not being used anymore, so I wonder if that means that needed to be incremented and it's not. Oh, you know that probably makes sense. Uh, CT. The nice thing about warnings is that it was just like a wrapping ad before. Yeah, or just an addition. Uh, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm not trying to go here for perfection. And. Daniel, yes, you may be totally right. That is because ARM was embedded oriented for longer before, probably, if I had to guess. Um, also, just like starting later with hindsight, oh, too. Oh. Hey, okay. there you go. <laughs> okay, so then I know that what I need to do is one, increase the delay, and then like have each of the pixels start off at like different values, because otherwise mm. this is not going to, otherwise it's going to blink them all. It's going to be the whole one. strip. Yeah. Yeah. But at least it like that's the kind of nice thing is that you can kind of see that happening. And you're like, oh, <laughs> okay. Like clearly this is wrong. And I can yeah. kind of figure out why. Which is great compared to uh some other times where you're just like, I have no idea what I got with this request and I'm it's, it's somewhere in the code that I have to fix it. The worst is when it like it works and then like two weeks later you're like why did that work? Like nothing <laughs> about that was right. Like everything about that was wrong and terrible why did that work or why did this come so close to working like i guess that's software in a nutshell i don't know if that's really hardware specific but it like it blows my mind even more with hardware where i've like no i've configured the hardware very wrong and it still gave me something <laughs> like yeah when i was first I, getting these leds driver going like you're supposed to run this at three megahertz and accidentally i configured it to run at three hertz because it was just like give me the frequency and i just typed three for some reason and uh, like somehow it managed to get like three of the LEDs to blink. And I'm like, oh, why isn't it making any of the other LEDs to blink? And it was just, it was good enough garbage, I guess, that it was, it confused the first couple LEDs into like displaying some noise. I, uh, I was working on bringing up a watchdog timer, which basically, if y'all are not familiar with, basically like there's this, I, I like to joke that it's similar to the movie Speed, but like it's good, <laughs> not bad. So basically it's like, <laughs> this thing pays attention to what's going on and if something goes bad it restarts the machine because like the the premise is basically like if you get into a really bad state rebooting is like the correct thing to do and yes. so what it basically ends up happening is that it's just a counter that counts down and if it hits zero your machine reboots so the idea is that you have a process that's basically like monitoring system health and if it thinks everything is healthy it tops off the counter so that you don't hit zero and then if it's like not healthy it doesn't fill it back up and so it hits zero and restarts it's kind of like the general idea and so uh i was playing around with one of these and there's this problem where whenever the like uh, PyOCD would not actually like, oh, okay. whenever whenever the machine would turn off, PyOCD would drop the connection. And so I actually like couldn't test that my thing was working properly because I could see it like reboot, but then I couldn't Almost. see it like actually start up again <laughs> because it turning <laughs> itself off would disconnect it from the debugger. And so that was like really annoying and dumb. Um, yeah, I've had that, yeah. and I've also had watchdogs get really weird because we had one that, like, it would do an, a system memory check every time it booted up. And so we, it was a totally working system, and then we realized, like, we'd only used, like, 32 of the 64 megs of RAM on this chip. So this is a, like, this is avionic stuff. So it was because we had done a hardware change at some point, and originally the board had 32 megs, 
and but that was enough for us and then someone was like oh the 64 meg piece costs the same amount so we'll just put 64 megs on there and eventually we needed the more memory so we turned yeah. it on and like all you had to do was change the config file to be like use all 64 megs of ram so we did that and the device wouldn't boot anymore and we're like what and then you turn it back and it would work and we're like what is this so eventually i had to go and like step through the assembly and in the boot process it turns out that the time that it took to do a memory self-test 32 megabytes was fast enough that it wouldn't hit the watchdog and 64 <laughs> megabytes was too oh, long no. <laughs> but the problem is the memory test because it was supposed to be fast was all handwritten assembly so then it was my job to be like, all right, I need to change the memory test routine where like every eight megabytes it goes and feeds the watchdog. So like that was, I think the the last time I wrote safety critical assembly and I think it took me like three days just to convince myself that I had written the assembly correctly to yeah. do like really nothing else except for petting the watchdog every eight megabytes <laughs> of uh, memory check. Yeah, yeah. X so one, one, we are allowed to talk about risk five i don't know how much people know or about or have opinions about risk five but it, it, being allowed to talk about it sure I guess. yeah I don't know. sorry you might want to make that more than thing. one at a time just because the difference between one and the leds isn't a lot so you probably want something like five or ten five. you have 30 leds so okay. plus 10 would be too much because it's that it would roll over although that might be a good thing yeah, and we'll do a wrapping ad for this one because we kind sure. of expect it to roll over a bit. All right, right let's num try equal, that. Num, num equal. Oh, oh, are you carrying? Yeah, that? num equals num. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. there's so much stuff on my screen. Okay, there we go. I think we should be good now. All right, let's give it a try. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of what I wanted. That's cool. It's like accelerating too. Yeah, it's probably dark at the end because of the the fact oh. that the addition by ten is not. It doesn't fit within two fifty six, right? So you end up like hitting a spot where it's. But that doesn't mean it's not cool looking, of course. But I'm just like yeah. I'm always trying to like think about like why does it look the way that it looks like. Uh, so well, I, yeah, it's like um, accelerating, and I don't know why it's accelerating. <laughs> because <laughs> like now it's, it's aliasing and it's going the other way. Oh, yeah. oh, it's like uh, a, a B movie, but every time you uh, loop through the LEDs, it goes faster. Yeah. Oh, I guess it's because the the larger count gets, the more it wraps. So as as we get close, like when count actually wraps down back, it gets slower again. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So it's gonna get slower and then faster and then slower and then faster. I guess that's super cool. Yeah, it'll when it gets slower, it's actually like aliasing and wrapping around until it actually gets back closer to zero. That's super cool. Yeah, someone is saying it looks like the Windows ninety five progress bar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was kind of going for something like that. Definitely. I was the 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 acceleration part was uh, <laughs> bit unexpected, but it works. Katozi so and uh, Toyota unexpected acceleration. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, harsh joke. Oh. <laughs> I mean, now I have to come up with a way to make uh, emissions skip a check or something, right? That's the other, oh, other so thing. So there's actually a package for um, yeah. JavaScript called uh, Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Yeah. And so it will detect when tests are running and then automatically say that they pass on yeah. CI, which I think is excellent. And I think someone made a version for that for Rust as well. I believe so. I, yeah. think, I think I've seen it. Yeah. Which honestly, that's just incredible. <laughs> yeah, Elliot, it's true. The red red would look like Night Rider, definitely. Oh yeah, do we want to try it with a uh... red? Yeah, yeah you do you want to swap the it B over and the red? R? It would look like the the Night Rider uh, car. All right, let's just swap it to. The R. We'll just go backwards because I'm not gonna do a whole bunch of uh, stuff. So, Steve, right, how's your trigonometry go. knowledge? Terrible. <laughs> you want to put a sine wave on here? Oh God! Let he was without sign cast the first wave. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right, let's get the let's get the red Knight Rider car first. Is it ready to go? Yeah, yeah. It should be. I just swapped some letters, which is nice. Uh, uh negative Ghost like Rider, you were right? 
did oh I, oh it's slowly doing all of them the same color oh it's because check it out on line 64 you for you missed a b to r so it's actually oh. doing it based on the value of b not the value of r ah there we go oh that was like that was like really weird <laughs> Yeah, there, there we go. Do we do we look like Cylons now? Yeah, I was gonna say, or like a yeah. Cylon. Yeah, that would also be a good. Gosh, my, my I love <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. Honestly, the greatest part is when Adama just like drops the ship straight into the atmosphere, shoots out all the ships, and then yells "jump," and then they just go. God. Spoiler alert! God. <laughs> <laughs> it's been out. It's, it's been only out a thirty for... or ten year old show based Do... on whichever <laughs> whichever one you want. Like. At this at this point, you kind of <laughs> don't remember if that happens in both of them or not. Yeah, okay, two thousand two thousand four, and then yeah, like nineteen seventy eight. So yeah, the statute of limitations on spoilers is definitely dead by this yeah. point. I would say. <laughs> Here we go. Let's let's see if we can get it. Wow. One thing I thought might be good to talk about since we're talking about being new to embedded stuff too is like just briefly going over like what these different parts are and what they're doing oh, before we went on more things. Cause like, for example, like, you know, I basically just like heard people say like, oh yeah, you just like do the GPIO, whatever. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah that's an acronym. I totally understand what that is. I have, um, I, so, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm going to just quickly grab some more coffee. I'll be right back. Totally. Okay, no worries. Although, although he's probably yeah, the that, one person that we would want to explain yeah, this to. Yeah, we want to make sure he's here to explain this stuff. But I guess just like also, I think that this is important. I think it's something you're trying to get at, James, with your new work and something I'm very interested in, which is this stuff is not as hard as it seems like it is. It's definitely not simple and it's different than like web work, for example, but like it is fundamentally knowable and you can just kind of like get into it and screw around and like do stuff. So I think it's like important that you don't, like a lot of times this embedded stuff is presented as like you have to know everything to do anything useful or whatever because the details matter but that doesn't mean the details are not learnable or that like you can't get into it so if you're like thinking about doing this stuff you should like give it a shot it's definitely slow going at times like i said i've been working on my task my task switching code for like two weeks now or something and i still can't get it to freaking work um but uh you know that's just like part of it's like no different than when i was like trying to get a website to work uh just yeah I mean, it's different like why does my database connection details. keep failing like yeah exactly it's different in the details but it's not like fundamentally harder or anything um it's just less familiar maybe yeah that's one of those things that it was really that's always been a bummer for me in embedded stuff is that it, it's kind of had that like old school operating system developer kind of vibe to it of the like we are the gray beard wizards and you haven't been doing this for 30 years and you don't know what a clock pin mux is. And yeah. you don't know, like it, I, I feel like embedded had felt in, especially in some sections, very like gatekeepery to me. And it's one of those things where yeah. embedded is challenging, but like you said, it's just a different subset of knowledge. Like, and I, I'm yeah. very confident that anyone who uh, anyone can learn embedded certainly. And people who, who, who excel in other areas can definitely like, I don't think there's anything like ah, I'm the best cause I can do embedded. Cause I think anyone with, with comfortability in programming could switch that subset over to embedded pretty easily. It's just a, uh, it's one of the most like disjoint sets of knowledge. So if you're doing like front end versus back end versus desktop programming, all those are different subsets, but they, they have more shared than they have disparate. Mm -hmm. Whereas once you start getting into embedded, you start throwing in like, you need to understand some electrical engineering stuff and you need to understand some stuff like that. And a lot of it, you don't need a lot to do embedded systems. So like learning a little bit will take you a long way until you get down into a, like a deeper rabbit hole. Definitely. But it, it's also mm -hmm. been a, an area where there hasn't been as much good open source training material as I feel like other programming disciplines are. And that's definitely, I mean, that's something we try to do for the embedded working group is having like the discovery book, which teaches yeah. you embedded from mm -hmm. scratch and the embedded Rust book, which teaches you embedded Rust from scratch. Um, and having those two different books were really important to us because we realized there were people who were from embedded and need to learn Rust and people from Rust that wanted to learn embedded and some people that were from neither and wanted to learn embedded Rust. And yeah. like being able to help all of those people were was really important to us. I also think this is shifting because say, saying like, cultural trauma is maybe a little too strong, but like a lot of people in the embedded space have this attitude because they've seen some shit 
And so, mm-hmm. like, the attitude that, like, you have to pay attention to this is because, like, back in the day when stuff was a lot flakier and there was a lot more, like, you know, you can, like, I mean, you can break hardware with software that's wrong, too, and, like, kind of that stuff. So there's kind of this carryover, carryover attitude from a time when the tools were worse, stuff was more expensive, things could do a lot less. And now that we're kind of in this world where, like, so I had this argument on Hacker News the other day with someone where they were, there was oh, no. a new keyboard came out and they were, like, <laughs> why is this using a whole arm chip instead of just like an AT mega, you know, R- AVR or whatever. And I was like, the parts are the same price actually. So yeah. like, why would you not want to have the like newer, more capable chip? I mean, there's good reasons to not want it actually, but they were like, Oh, I just didn't realize that you could get an arm processor for $5. Like I just like assumed oh. that you're spending like 50 bucks on this when you could do it with a chip that's like $2 or whatever. And like, I didn't realize the price had come down to that point. And it's like, yeah, like actually, mm-hmm. you know, like, it's we've gotten stuff that is like better and more capable that's more accessible as well so some of that attitude is carrying over from the day when that was not true and it was like much harder and more difficult in general too so i think there's also some of that like the world is changing in a way that i think is really positive uh and so that's also yeah definitely a big part of it too Um, there's open source is becoming a big thing too like Definitely before Arduino existed. So people have different opinions about Ar- Arduinos and things like that because they're, they're a tool to make embedded systems more accessible. And mm-hmm. the, the old school embedded people went, ah, it's, it's the that's not real programming kind of thing that always gets on my nerves. Yeah. Um, but nice they really did change the mindset where like dev boards used to cost like 500 bucks. Like yeah. if you wanted to, Oof. if you wanted to get a dev board because it was aimed at only engineers... It costs like 500 bucks. You'd get a CD with a super proprietary compiler based on it. Um, and like, there'd be very few docs and very few anything. And like, there's a couple things that changed around the same time. But like, really, with Arduino coming out, they were like, look, the dev board costs like 25 bucks, which is a big difference from the way it is. All of the tool chains open source, like, it's based on GCC and we'll, we'll ship you an editor and a debugger, or not a debugger, but you get a console <laughs> output basically. Um, and we'll make hardware that works with it. And like, that was just like, that has changed the industry in the last 10 years where now yeah. you have like, when people are shipping, like when Nordic ships this dev board, this costs like 30, 35 bucks. And it's one of the more expensive ones, but you can get dev boards for like two bucks now and you can get chips for like 10 cents now. And almost always the schematics will be open source. The tool chain will be open source. Like the vendor supports open source. Mm-hmm. And it's just really like changing what is and isn't possible in terms of like, learning as a hobbyist and then even taking that professional yeah i'm up to yeah. three dev boards yeah. now and so i have the classic discovery uh which this is a, a i have stm 32 f4 <laughs> f3 yeah you got way more but this was like i think this was like 15 dollars or something and that's like whole computer there and i have this like yeah. lpc 55 from nxp and i think this dev board was like thirty dollars or something and it's got like a micro sd card on there and like four different usb three ports and like all this stuff and then like i have this nucleo h7 and this is like got a freaking ethernet jack on it or whatever and i think this is like 45 bucks total or something and so it's just like you know and they get a full dev board and like obviously you know fifty dollars is still not free or anything but just like it's very different than that era of exactly what you're saying like it used to be like oh there's a couple hundred dollars or like you know, um, that kind of thing. Like, it's just not as big of a deal. Um, yeah, like, e- accessibility is becoming, like, an actual thing. Like, e- even just, like, the comparison of, like, the documentation is, like, I don't know if anyone's been on, like, the OS dev wiki, but, like, it's awful. <laughs> but, like, if you wanted to, like, like how, do, how do I write an operating system for, uh, like, a computer? And, like, that was where you had to go. And, and all the people there, like, didn't really care to write good documentation about it, because yeah. they're, like, Oh, you it's already nothing, have to know. It doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's like you already have to know all of these things. Um, and it and it was like, well, why why do I have to like now go do all these things? Like I don't know. Like I, it would be great if you like taught me. Um, and and then you know, but now like Phil Ops like OS in Rust tutorial is fantastic. I'm like, oh, oh I goodness, learned it's so good. I learned. I learned more from that tutorial than I ever did in my operating systems class in college. Yeah. <laughs> like I was like, oh, that's how interrupts work. This is how like paging actually works. Cause I was like, I don't know what's a page. I don't know. Um, and so like seeing that kind of like material come out and then like, especially like embedded stuff, like I've like, I've read some of the Rust embedded things and I'm like, oh wow. Like, oh, this is 
very user friendly and accessible. Like, I wish we had more of this all over the place. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely like it, it makes a difference, and that's really what we're trying to do. Or as part of the embedded working group, that's like what we're trying to do is make that kind of the same way that Rust made it. Like, you know. The idea is that there's nothing really that special about systems programming. Like it's definitely got different concerns and things like that, but the goal is to make everyone capable of doing it. And for the people that really need to change the power knobs that they can change the power knobs too when they need to, but they don't always need to. And I think taking that to embedded makes this like, it blows my mind still that you can do this stuff so quickly and that there's libraries and things like that. And especially because the ecosystem is starting to work on no standard stuff. When I was doing some wireless communication stuff, I used just like the standard Rust crypto uh, crate. And like I added encryption to a wireless link in about 15 minutes because I was just like, oh, I'll use Cha Cha 8 Poly 1305 wrap that around every frame. Okay, I have encryption. And like it worked on my microcontroller with zero like, shenanigans and basically i i hopped on chat bugged tony arcieri i was like which crate should i use and he's like use cha cha 8 poly 1305 and i was like okay added it to my crate wrapped the <laughs> message in there and then i was like receiving encrypted messages from my embedded system on the other side in like literally 15 minutes and it just blows my mind like code reuse has not been a thing in embedded in the past and yeah. like or like code reuse means copy and paste the driver from someone else and then change it fundamentally to work with your chip, which works differently. <laughs> yeah. And like the fact that I'm using standard, like uh -huh. the smart lead crate and all I have to do is give it a serial port basically. And then it just works. That's yeah. actually probably a good thing. I'm going to, I'm going to cut back. Yeah. And... So we should talk about these first 10 lines or whatever yeah. and get into what this hardware actually is as just a. Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. cause when you, you talk say about that relationship between the Hal crates and the not Hal crates, for example, too, would also be cool. Like, yeah. And P zero yeah. so parts. I've definitely done other i've definitely done other streams where i've done this all from scratch so i'm not going to go super super deep but i'll give a reasonable high level uh steve we've lost your audio but yeah oh weird um or maybe no no, no excuse me i think i was looking i'm looking at the youtube stream and the dashboard stream and gotcha. i think you were talking which is delayed like 10 seconds I'm yeah confused myself. i'm running the booth <laughs> while trying to talk and program at the same time um but yeah so running down the list um the way that we represent Peripheral. So what a peripheral is on the microcontroller is you have your CPU and your RAM, which are all on one chip. And that's like the special thing about microcontrollers is they're usually tightly integrated. You have everything you need that is a computer on one chip with no extra parts. So like RAMs in the same chip, CPUs in the same chip, all in there. your persistent storage, like a flash, all in the same chip. Usually like for with most chips nowadays, the only thing you need is an external clock. Sometimes you don't even need that anymore. Sometimes they can, you just give them voltage and they will start oscillating their own clock and the CPU just starts running it by itself. Um, so like these components of what we think as a, as a computer are the core CPU itself, the RAM that goes with it, the persistent storage like flash that's with it. And microcontrollers have this special extra set of things which are peripherals, which are essentially like, um, on your desktop, you'd have things like a floppy controller or a, a fan controller Ethernet or things like this. Or whatever. What's that? Or yeah, Ethernet. Ethernet it's like... Where it's stuff that's outside of the main CPU itself, but it's tightly coupled to the CPU so you can control it really well. Microcontrollers are designed to interact with the real world in a lot of different ways. So all of these microcontrollers have different peripherals. So they might have like a serial port per uh, peripheral or may even have something like uh, an Ethernet peripheral on there. And what they are is they're essentially like hardware actors that do stuff and the cpu can configure oh, okay. them and interact with them and delegate tasks off to them to either do them uh autonomously or just do them at regular rates so like if a cpu is pulling something it may not be able to keep like very specific um update rates that it needs to hit whereas if you just tell the hardware hey go do this stuff and it will take care of it um so these peripherals are all of the things on the chip that are not the CPU that interact with the real world. Um, and in Rust, we interact with these all as a singleton so that you have like specific ownership. So what we do at the top of almost every Rust program is you get all of your peripherals, which is a singleton operation, which means you can get it once and you have ownership of it. And if you try to get it again later, it says, nope, already been giving out. And by doing that, we can use Rust's ownership semantics 
to make sure that you don't have two parts of your code trying to mess with the same part of hardware at the same time. Oh, so if cool. you want to like take that piece of hardware and delegate it, you can, but it's done through borrowing and ownership in the same way that you would with something like a database connection pool. So you would get like <laughs> one database connection pool mm -hmm. and you might hand out handles to a bunch of different places, but there's only one of them in your whole program or like a scheduler for an async await program. There might be like one singleton of those. Yeah. And this cool. is a great example of how Rust, like the, the rules being all compile time really shines because you don't pay for that tracking because that's all the ownership system, just like doing it at compile time for you. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, we do this in a very special way that is super low <laughs> overhead in that like these tokens that it uh, represent ownership are zero size types. So like even holding them and passing them around takes no RAM, takes no CPU, but the borrow checker, like Steve says, enforces it at compile time where if you ever do it wrong, it just doesn't compile. And I won't get yeah. in, I won't get much deeper than that today, but essentially they're, they're zero size types. So they cost you essentially nothing. Yeah. I really like uh, using the compiler to like enforce stuff. Uh, like one of the things I was doing at work was like, Essentially, because you had to pass some stuff across create boundaries, uh, because you had to break up large code bases, because otherwise things don't work uh, or compile fast enough. Um, we 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 like we're using traits to like pass information about types across the boundary, but you would have to like register this type in order for the thing I was working on to work. Um, but you could forget to do that, and then you wouldn't find out till runtime. And so then, uh, what we did was uh, we used the link me crate that uh, the Talne mm -hmm. worked on, and so it did some linker shenanigans. And then you were able to kind of get around the orphan uh, borrow check rules uh, or the orphan rules, and then it would at compile time, like when you were like, "Give me this type out of this like heterogeneous collection of stuff," um, it'd be like if you had never like given it the attribute or registered it, like the entire compiler would be like, "Nope." you you didn't do this like you've got to go do that now and so we were able to like use a compiler error to like enforce something uh to make sure that there would be valid state at runtime and then obviously there's no overhead as a result of it so it's like really cool to see like embedded it also kind of like doing the same thing but like in a different way like you can utilize the compiler in such a way that you can just make certain states just invalid which i think is really neat yeah, we yep. use that all over the place in embedded. We generally call it type state programming, but we um, it's interesting. You can't see it here, but we, we actually do that sometimes where if we know that a peripheral is in an inactive state, we'll give it like a, um, uh, a type state struct essentially that says like, okay, it starts in the inactive mode. And then before you can use the methods that assume that it's working, you have to call the activate method, which consumes the inactive version and gives you back inactive version and things like that. So we use that type state all over the place and embedded because it, it means that like, yeah, we, we know that it's going to work at runtime and that you don't like, oh, I, I tried to enable something that hadn't been configured or something like that. And that wouldn't mm -hmm. make sense. That's I mean, it. you can see this sort of here where we see this GPI, uh, so I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you can see that this says P030 output push pull. Um, mm -hmm. I'll get to that in a second, but let's keep going down here. So we have a timer. So one of the most common peripherals that all, almost every microcontroller has is some kind of timer um, where you can do something like, uh, a timer usually breaks down to just, it's just a counter most of the time or a rolling counter sometimes. A lot of times they'll have different modes and configurations and you make, you can make them count up and count down. But what you say is like, I'm gonna take some clock source, maybe that's running at a megahertz. And every time that clock ticks, I want you to increment a counter. So you can do things like measure timing really accurately because it's the hardware actually incrementing the counter every time some input ticks. And you can also do things like uh, I'm going to wait until this timer hits a thousand, which means that it's been uh, a millisecond if you're counting at one megahertz. Or I can do something like when this counter hits 4.2 thousand, give me an interrupt. So that you can have like a really precise time where you say like, okay, I just sent a packet. Let me also start a timer that's my timeout. And if this timer fire. basically hits yeah. its max value, then it's going to fire an interrupt that says, hey, oops, a timeout occurred you need to like clean up now, basically. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Do Does Embedded also kind of sometimes have the problem where like time goes backwards every now and then? 
Yeah. Um, it can, depending on your... So you typically have different timers that can have different resolutions. So our version of timing going backwards is if you made it an 8-bit timer okay. and you let it count longer than 255 counts, then it'll usually roll over. Most timers can be configured so they can do things like send an event when it rolls over or send an event when it loops or just when it hits max value, just stick. So um, she didn't like configure that and you didn't yeah. realize it and then it happens and you're like, what is going on? Time is wrong. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Time so it's like wrong. Yeah. Cause uh, one of my favorite bits of the standard library is for uh, time. <laughs> and it's just like, it, it's just this, it's just this whole block of code. Where it's just our comments. Like, These are the targets that where time has moved backwards. So don't trust this target. And it's or, like or it's every like, major platform. Or it's, it's like we found like a whole bunch of bugs out in the wild, and so here the here's the white list of all the ones that have not gone backwards yet. Yeah, and then everything else is just assumed to go backwards. So I, it's just always funny to kind of see uh, time based bugs. Yeah, yeah, it, it hurts, but it's funny. Um, so then the next, so what we do here and the way this works is um, this board timer zero actually is. We have kind of two levels of peripherals in Rust. So we have like the raw ones. These usually come from what's called a pack or a peripheral access crate. And this mm -hmm. is the really low level like memory mapped interaction. So when I say the CPU can interact with these peripherals, the way they do that is they actually have like a structure mapped to memory at a fixed memory address. So like the way you interact with them is you write like this byte at this memory address. And that like sets a configuration table variable. Um, and the pack deals with all of these kind of things. So the timer wouldn't say like start, you wouldn't have a method that's like start timer for 32 milliseconds. Cause that's like a really high level human abstraction mm -hmm. over that. The abstractions at this layer are like, put the value 4,200 in this register, which is like your max counter value and put the value 16 in this register, which is like your um, step down counter. So instead of ticking on every frequency, it's going to only count every 16 counts or something like that. So it's like gotcha. really low level byte level um, interactions. If you've worked on embedded before, you'll usually have like a header file where you write some macro defined value to some macro defined address. And that's how you configure things in C usually. In Rust, we give them at least um, like function level interactions. But then we typically have the next layer of abstraction up, which is the hardware abstraction layer. And this is where you oh, do like that's what human for. level things. Yeah, so you have pack and how. And that's where you say, like, this is a timer. So you might want to do something like configure and start timer or set timeout to whatever. Um, and the way we usually do this in Rust is we have these how peripherals take ownership of a pack peripheral. And what that says is I'm going to take ownership of this and I can start making assumptions that I'm the only one configuring it, which means I can provide higher level abstractions on this, um, which work with that. So if you want to have a timer that delays for 50 milliseconds, it knows how to do all the configuration at a low level and just works with it. Oh, so is the That's, so is like the timer zero in this case, like it implements some trait and then that says, here's how you do this thing. And then like the timer itself can like use that to like do stuff. Like it kind of can close. make a So this, uh, this board has like four different timers. So the hardware just has four different timer peripherals it can work with. And this timer, Hal, is generic over any of these. So when we implement it, we make it generic over those. Um, there's a little like uh, marker trait we use to make it generic over that. But uh -huh. um, essentially, yeah, we, we just you make it generic over that. You can see how it's actually in the type, the type signature that it's showing you is exactly. that it's a timer on timer zero. Oh, OK, cool. Yeah, exactly. Neat. Because it's like um, you might have different timers that are run at different. Like sometimes you know a, a board will be like, I have one one megahertz timer and one kilohertz timer or whatever, and so you're like, uh -huh. pick which one it is you want to be doing. And sometimes it'll be like, I have five timers that are all configurable, and you for your application set one of them at this time and the other one at this time, and like blah, yeah. Blah. And sometimes they have different features. Like a lot of the times you'll have, if you have five timers, maybe three of them have a max 32-bit resolution, but then the last two will only have a 16-bit resolution, which means the highest counter number you can count there is 65,000 or so. So sometimes you want to use different counters for different purposes, or sometimes internally those timers will be wired up to do things automatically. Like one might be typically used with a serial port or something like that. So it might have some extra features where it can connect directly to a serial port or something to do reloading values or something like that. So a lot of these peripherals often can be chained together in special ways. 
Cool. Um, That's really neat. So the next part is our GPIOs. So GPIOs are all the pins on the microcontroller. So whenever you had like uh, a digital in or a digital out in um, Arduino or an analog in or an analog out, those are GPIO pins. And GPIO stands for general purpose input output. Um, generally, all of these peripherals get wired up to one of these pins because that's how you actually connect to the outside of the chip world. Um, and most of these pins are configurable. So you can either set them as an input or an output. You can set them as digital or analog. And you can set them as like a regular GPIO, which can just set high or low. Or you can say this GPIO is specifically uh, a PWM pin, which can do extra stuff. Or uh, it's a serial port pin. Um, so these are all of our like configurable pins on the chip. And the NRF52 is really great because you can map any functionality to any pin. So any pin can be a serial port, a, a digital high-low, an analog high-low. Actually, not everything can be analog. That's the one exception on the NRF52. But all of the other stuff, like serial ports, can be mapped wherever. So what and we do is... Go ahead. PWM is pulse width, pulse width modulation? Like it can go from like some low number to some high number or something like that? Like somewhere Exactly. Between. That's how you kind of simulate analog output is with PWM. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Because what it does is within one window... It sets the bit low for a while and high for a while, and sometimes even subdivides that so it's smoother. So if you, okay. but it does it at a frequency that's way faster than your eyes can see, like 800 kilohertz or something like that, so that it's it's pulsing it's really fast. really quickly. So your eyes can't see it, but if you looked at it on a an oscilloscope or something like that, you'd see it's like that. But if you put it up to a capacitor or averaged the value over time, it would average to something like 50% of the voltage. So five volts averaged over 50% would look like it's 20, uh, 2.5 volts or something like that. Cool. So this chip has two ports. So each port is 32 pins. So what we do is we say, okay, we're going to turn this P0 pack peripheral into a P0 parts, which is a HAL abstraction over the zero port. Um, and different microcontrollers do this in different ways, but this is how we do this in the NRF52. And what this gives you back is a struct with essentially 32 pins in it. Um, and they match their actual names. So we do that. And then what we do is specifically, we start configuring that pin. So I have pin 030 wired up to my microcontroller or to my uh, LED strip. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, take that P0, 30, so port zero, pin 30, turn it into a push-pull output, which makes it an output that can be set high or low. And I say the initial level is going to be low. So what this does is this is exactly that state transition. I take it from an uninitialized pin, which defaults to an, a floating input pin, and instead changes it to an output pin that's been set to low. And this is this, if you look at this into push-pull output, it takes ownership of self and gives you back a pin 030 output push pull. So we actually have a different type for each pin because sometimes you can only do certain things with certain pins. So we would only implement certain functionality on certain pins and things like that. So if we actually tried to configure a pin that doesn't support that, it wouldn't compile because it would say, this configuration isn't supported for this pin. And so, like, um, so the, PZ, the PZ030 field is like its own type that has certain... Yeah methods implemented it, on it then. You yeah. can see it in Rust Analyzer. It is a P030, which is configured output. as output. And the specific output, because there's a couple different kinds of outputs you can be, mm -hmm. um, push-pull output is the one that we want here. So we represent this as yeah. a type state. Yeah, that's and cool. this is why like this is all super useful for, it's, it's like simultaneously makes it easier and harder to learn because it's easier to learn because you can't like misunderstand what peripherals can do what because it's all encoded in the types but it also makes the rust doc output like super hard because there's like a lot of generic types in a lot of different places and it can be like super confusing honestly sometimes um so yeah it's like both this good is and what bad. steve you were on a podcast lately and you you describe this as it's harder to get something, but it's easier to get something right. And I think yeah. that's like a really good characterization. And we're trying to figure out the um, the right balance of that, of like easy to use versus like getting things correct at compile time. Yeah. 
because embedded is one of those things because the computer's over there. So debugging, it's always harder than debugging the code on your PC. So like the more of that checking you can move to compile time, the better. But like, like you said, it's like a UX code and docs kind of challenge to make that reasonably representable. So it makes sense why things went wrong. And sometimes you'll find something in Rust doc, like a lot of times too, where I'm like, okay, I want to bring up this new peripheral. So I'm going to like write a driver for it. So the, the chipset will say, oh, here's the name of this register or whatever. So then I go into Rust doc and I type in the name of the register and it's like, it's there. And it's like, cool. But how do I actually like get to that in the code from the chain of like 15 types to assemble, you know, it's like very type tetris -y where it's like, okay, I have, you know, this, uh, oh, I knew, I know I need this PWM zero, but like, how do I go from that to the thing that I actually want to do or whatever? And like, you end up just kind of like figuring out eventually. I feel like it took me like a week or two to get comfortable with. Yeah. Once I did, it's like super great, but it takes a little bit of time to like figure out like, okay, this module usually comes from a function that's off of this register that's named something similar. And like, I call that and that gives me access to the type that lets me do the things that are in this module or like whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you can use Rust doc with all of this, which is nice, but there's a bit of a learning curve to figure out how to traverse like the generic types and stuff like that. But that's another one of those like docs for embedded system libraries is a really big deal. And the fact that Rust doc just works out of the box is amazing. And I know Gray was in the chat earlier. So huge thanks to everyone who worked or has worked or will work on Rust doc because that's huge in the embedded world. Like there's a couple things in the Rust ecosystem that like by themselves would be a revolutionary change in embedded stuff like cargo, stuff like Rust doc, stuff like, um, yeah, like any of these things by themselves would be a huge revolutionary improvement for embedded systems. And the fact that you get all of them by switching to uh, Rust is like a really big thing. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so I'll keep going. I do want to get back to blinking some more LEDs, so I might cut yeah. back into here. So I'm well, going to say one last little tiny thing on that. You should bring the code up real quick too. Another thing is like oh, people right. uh, don't like Oops. forget is that like drivers are just like a, a name for a certain kind of abstraction level. So like if you yeah. pulled like this and RNG doesn't count, pixels don't. But like if you pulled all this stuff out into like a function, that like is a driver. Like we talk about like yeah. writing drivers or whatever. Like it's not, it's nothing. Like it feels magical when you're at the like the not in embedded kind of like mode of things. But like realistically, like you know, writing some code that turns on a peripheral, configures it a little bit, gives you like access to something. Like you are writing a driver, and it's not actually magical and special. It's just like you know, I mean, there's rules and stuff, but like it's nothing fancier than like functions that do this kind of work are drivers or whatever. Um, oh. Yeah. So. And most of the hard part about this is just reading the data sheets and material and stuff like that, because a lot of embedded is just marshalling bytes, like writing these kinds of drivers yeah. is just reading the data sheet and going, OK, this byte needs to go here and this byte needs to go here and this byte needs to go here. And then I have to wait 20 microseconds and then I have to put this byte here. And it's just like a, it, it's certainly like stuff that's definitely achievable for folks. Sounds like accounting, but for programmers. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, it's not so different from like writing a, like a REST API or something like that. If you're if you're trying to learn how to interact with a REST API or something like that, you have yeah. to go and read the docs for that REST API. And then you like send a REST request and it gets rejected and you go, oh, I didn't set my content type JSON. And then it's yeah. like, oh, I called this one before I had my access token. And like a lot of it's exactly the same, just in embedded systems. You're just like on a different zoom level of, of abstraction. And like, yeah, you're reading a data sheet instead of someone's API docs on a website or something like that. Yeah. I'm yeah, going to wait sense. for like two seconds while you go into this code, James, but I will be right back. Yeah, I think actually I'm going to go ahead and let's take a five minute break because it is hot here and I need to go get more water. I have air conditioning in my living room, but I don't have it in the office. So I'm going to go oh, drink no. some cold water. And uh, let's come back in five minutes and we'll we'll keep diving deeper. So I'll see yeah, you all in five me. minutes and we'll be back.
Hey, thanks for sticking through the break. It was, uh, it's like, well, 37 degrees here. It's hot. It's probably like 90s uh, in Fahrenheit today. And we did go full American and splurge and get like one of those standing unit air conditioners for our living room because Kuma, we have a little corgi and he's very furry and he was miserable last summer. And we were miserable last summer, but we, we would put up with it for us. But for, for Kuma, we decided to get it. So I had to yeah. go stand in the air conditioned room and get a, a cold, cold drink again. I did see Buka on the stream for a little bit there too. Yeah. So uh, I'm lucky that I have central air, but uh, so my dog is right here. Oh, so that's Buka. Um, but he, uh, if you saw me like t turning my mic on and off every now and then and like kind of like saying words, it was because he was barking in the background and you might have heard yeah. it at one point. Um, so I basically got him like a, his little Kong bone and like filled it up with like peanut butter and stuff to kind of like keep him occupied for a bit because he'll just chew nice. on that sucker for like a while yeah, and like just not great. worry and not worry about the fact that there might be people out in the hallway that he doesn't and can't see. And so it scares him. <laughs> yeah. It's been uh, about, oh, it's been over a hundred uh, for the last like month here, uh, basically. So yeah, I've been waking up at six every day to take Mateo for a walk because it's too hot to do so during the actual like daytime. So I'm now like waking up really early every day, which is like kind of great and also kind of terrible, but at least I've gotten good at napping. So like I woke up at six and walked him for about 40 minutes and then went back to sleep for like 40 minutes this morning to like make sure I was going to be awake enough for this stream. So normally in the morning I'm <laughs> like, uh, I'm drinking way too much coffee and trying to deal with this threading code. Maybe that's why it's not working for me is because I'm always like got no sleep. But anyway, oh, my dog is in another yeah. room, so I can't, uh, I can't. Well, maybe I can. Maybe, I don't want to. He's being really good right now. I don't mess him up. Right before we sign <laughs> off, I'll be like, "This is goodbye," but I don't. I don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. So I'm not to be good it. enough to like stay on this bed and just like chill out. Like this blanket is actually like a dog blanket. So sometimes, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Very anyway, cool. so I'll go through the rest of these. I, I won't go into too much more detail. So the PWM yeah. is something I wrote. Um, the other thing that you do a lot of embedded is you use and abuse peripherals sometimes for what they were meant for and sometimes what they were not meant for. <laughs> so the protocol for these LEDs is actually really timing specific that you've got um, you've got something like a, a low period and you have a high period. So for each bit, you have a window that's kind of like this. Um, actually, I think it starts maybe high and goes low. I can't Dang, honestly that's remember. That's some fancy, fancy Unicode typing you got there. That's awesome. <laughs> so like you do this and the way that it decides whether each bit is high or low is the, um, the ratio between the high and low part. So for each bit, it's something like a short high and a long low means a zero and a long high and a short zero means a one or something like that. Um, and it does that so you only need one wire to command it. So you're basically shoving clock and data through the same pin, which is really great if you're driving a lot of LEDs and you're connecting all of these and they act like they each of them pass the data they get to the next one. And then when you pause low for a certain amount of time, they latch that data in. So they act like a shift register, but like a weirdly clocked shift register for each of this. So it re requires really specific timing that's hard to do from the CPU itself. Um, but what this looks like is, as I was explaining PWM before, this looks exactly like what you would send in a PWM signal. So oh. what I do is I set the PWM window to be this amount of time, which is 1.25 microseconds. Because um, it's this clock runs at 800 uh kilohertz so like each of this total window is 800 kilohertz and then these have different amounts of time that they need to be high or low depending on it's a zero or one um so what i do is i queue up a bunch of pwm samples and the nrf52 has this functionality where you can do sequences of pwm so if you wanted to do like fancy led fades and stuff like that you could give it a sequence of pwms and the hardware will just go out and run through that sequence and it'll tell you when it's done so to drive these LEDs for each bit, I give it a PWM pattern um, and then just say, go run this sequence and tell me when you're done. So for each 24 bits of the LED, 
So eight red, eight green, and eight blue. I queue up 24 PWM sequences and just hit go. And that way my CPU only needs to keep up every LED, uh, full LED, instead of trying to count every single bit on the LED, it only has to jump in every 24 bytes of it. Um, so what I'm doing is I wrote a, a, a driver in Rust that uses the NRF. 50, so this comes from the NRF smart lead crate, which I wrote. And this mm -hmm. is specifically the PWM. There's another peripheral you can abuse on here called I, I squared S, which is used for audio, um, which you can also kind of like mess with and get it at exactly the right frequency that you need. And then just send like garbage looking data. Like it's terrible, not real I squared S data, but it ends up being the right waveform that you need for this. I haven't <laughs> written that yet. So right now we're, what we're doing is we take this driver that takes the PWM peripheral um, and it takes the pin that the LEDs are connected to and it drives that PWM that drives that GPIO using the PWM peripheral. So this is that kind of like peripheral interconnect thing that I was talking about before is that we wire up that GPIO pin to this PWM peripheral and the driver that we feed it is shoving in LED data continuously. Um, and then I've also wired that up to the smart LED crate which is just a generic trait for working with these kinds of programmable leds and that gets me all the stuff like the colors and things like that where once i say this is how you send bytes over this interface the smart led crate is generic over any kind of thing that implements the smart leds right trait which is basically just like put byte on wire or something like that it's a it's a fairly simple trait um so i give it that and i because this implements that trait i can use it there um, and this is what we've been using with the write function so this write function comes from the smart leds write trait um, and this leds uh, struct implements that trait so that's how we're able to like get all of these things together uh, we also have a random number generator again it just takes the rng peripheral and it implements the rand core traits from the rand crates so that's why we can do all of like rand methods from the actual rand crate um and do full rng type stuff there and is that uh, and IRGB? Oh, i was just gonna ask is that like the irgb8 is like the actual led strip yeah irgb is an adapter that i've written for bin format so bin format is our logging framework so it does the tracing and the graphing um and irgb8 is a wrapper struct i have around rgb with a position so it just takes the rgb color codes and then the position index so that i know it's between 0 and 30 um uh, or it actually it gets x and y coordinates although i think right now i've just hard coded it to be one right like this um so this becomes our our adapter around there so that we can log both the color value and the position to our logging framework oh cool so i do an init graph which sends a bin format call which says hey we have an x count of 30 and a y count of 1 so this is our 1 by 30 led strip Gotcha. Um, and then we start writing. But yeah, the rest of it we've been playing with already, so I won't get too deep yeah. into that. Um, but yeah, this is generally how it works. And then every time we hit write, we're just sending a new chunk of PWM data over here. That's yeah. really cool. The The nice thing about Rust Embedded is we, we want to have like different zoom levels, where if you're like just learning you'd probably start at the HAL layer and just use these like really high level stuff where you just say, I have a board and I have some timers and I want to send some data over LEDs and I can just do that. And you don't have to think about the hardware so much because we've effectively abstracted it away. But if you want to, you can just jump into any of these because they're just plain Rust code. There's nothing magical about that. And that's how most people I feel like get started today is they start with really high level crates and they go, oh, I wanted to do one more thing that it doesn't do today. And they start adapting it. And uh, I'm really bad at keeping my banners yeah. up to date. Um, but yeah, like somebody had said, like, oh, I expected to see more of the new inline assembly in this code. And it's like, yeah, you actually don't need to do any of that for yep. things that other people have written, which is more and more things all the time. But is also why getting more people into this is cool, because like, you know, you're able to say like, oh, yeah, I don't there's not a crate yet that abstracts this away. So like maybe, you know, you like start off by doing stuff where it all exists and is good. And then eventually you're like, oh, yeah, I want to do this thing. And nobody wrote it yet. So I guess I'm going to go do that. But you've like learned enough at that point. You're able to go do that work. That's yeah, really exactly. Cool. 
So I feel I like we need to blink some more LEDs. Yeah, we haven't gotten anything actually changing in a while, so it seems good. Yeah. So what should we build? Uh... Hmm. You said you wanted to do some fades, so let's do let's do some fades and let's mess around with some floating point math to uh Ooh. do some yeah. fades. So let's take uh we'll have two counters. Um I think what I'm going to do is U8 equals zero. I think every you time... You shadowed the previous CT. Yeah, you're going to need to rename it. Or not. Yeah. Okay, so I think every time we have this rollover, um, I guess... Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's actually keep it simple. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. We've got our count already. So let's set... All of this to uh, what's what's everyone's favorite color? Mine's red. <laughs> Out of RGB, it's red. Purple is my favorite color in the abstract. So, but they could also do that, of course. Um, my high school colors were all purple, and all the lockers were purple, and everything was purple all the time. And so, like, I just I can't yeah, do it anymore. It's personally. Totally fair. <laughs> not bring in purple. Uh, I feel like we keep oh. removing uh oh yeah i think i probably removed the imports earlier because i like undo did a bunch of stuff and then like went mm. forward because i was like uh, uh i don't remember how, wh what code was here and then i just went back yeah so then let's see uh pixel dot r equals or i'm gonna say equals so let's take pixels are as F32 um, times, let's see, count as F32 divided by 255.0. So this is like scaling our count between zero and max. Um, so this is going to scale the number. And then I take this whole thing... Um, as u8 because we know that it should be between 0 and 1 times a number that's between 0 and 255 so i can do oh no oh. why did you jump to code oh, oh um, no <laughs> e, e. i don't use vs code i'm actually a sublime text person but the vs code share is actually a really cool tool that we use in our trainings a lot and i was hoping you'd be able to also remote control this so yeah, yeah. So i mean what we do is we sorry go ahead yeah I'm, I'm a vim user so like i had to s set up yesterday like mm. here's here's all my mappings that i'm used to uh because yeah. like, i always use colmac for my keyboard and so like mm. i don't use cordy and uh neio becomes hjkl and if you know any vim that is really kind of the four worst keys that you could probably put there and so i had to like remap everything just so that i could use vs code in like a somewhat competent manner today <laughs> Yeah, I use the Vim plugin for VS Code, but I'm also super hyped about uh, OniVim too, and so hmm. I've been following that. I've along. heard a couple people talking about that. Yeah, apparently Rust Analyzer works and works with it as of like a couple days ago. So I've been going to try cool. that out at some point in the future. But oh, neat! It works. Where's our increment for it? Oh, so we are incrementing one at a time, right? So this is yeah, going, yeah. but it's you didn't you're not incrementing CT zero, CT two zero anywhere. Well, I got rid of CT zero. Okay. Or Dude. So this is just red times count as F32 divided by 255. Yeah, because that goes 0 to 255. Um, so is it like wrapping and then it goes, so basically turns into purple and then turns black versus like it turns into purple and then goes back? Is that kind yeah, of what you're trying to do? Yeah, I was expecting it to do more steps because it's just going up and then down. It's like a saw wave of purple, if that makes sense. Ah. Uh. So this is fading. Um, we can also do it out of phase with each other. So what's, uh, I can do count. So let, I can do these all out of phase with each other. So it's actually gonna rotate different colors. Um, so I can do count dot wrapping add zero. Uh, which is probably unnecessary, but I just wanted to make it consistent. I think I'm I probably have it. I'm with you with uh, the whole lining everything up just right, even if it's not the same. <laughs> so 
So let's do this. So they're all out of phase with each other. I uh, think your parentheses are all wrong. Yeah, probably. Uh, that might actually be right. That one's correct. And then on the next level, you have three on each of them. We should have two. Yeah. Yeah, that looks better. I think so. Nope. Nope. <laughs> uh, wrapping ad as F32. This wraps that. I actually don't need these ones at all. Yeah, you got an extra layer of parentheses. Got so but, many. Oh, okay. your extra. Yeah, your extra one. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, uh, yeah. Your extra I one was on the left on side, the so you need to get rid of those. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So this is actually, I think, right. Uh, yeah. Yes, right. that matches. Because uh -huh. I wanted the as you ate to be the last thing. <sighs> parentheses. <laughs> so we have like. Yeah. Red. Well, I guess purple is really just red blue. So like, yeah, it's not going to do a whole lot of green, I guess. But that's cool. Let me find. You know what I want to do? I'm just going to change this to white. I love some of the colors on here. I guess like. Oh, yeah, so cool. basically, each color is going to go up and then drop off, but they're dropping out like roughly out of phase with each other i didn't do a great job of dividing by three cleanly here uh yeah 255 divided by i don't know let's make it like 80 that's pretty clear that's 80 is much yeah. closer 160 240 yeah so it's yeah it's Kind of uh, slow cool. fading through different colors and getting pretty bright. That's neat. We also do have floating point numbers. So floating point numbers are a little interesting in terms. Oh no, I've done, I've done something. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I'm VS Code. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, we also have uh, like float functions through libm. So we could also do stuff like yeah, do the sign by actually doing it instead of. Yeah. Although we it's, also need like the absolute sign. Well, let's try doing that. Let's try and do a pulse and fade kind of thing. So is lib m get... like the lib c for? Uh... The m is so, short for math. So it's like just yeah. uh, very oh, basic it's... math functions, but in that lib software m. in case your hardware doesn't support it. So right. I would do like lib m sign. Okay, this is going to take, oh, sign f. Um, so I want to do, well, I am going to still do count as F32 divided by 155.0. Although this just gets me between zero and one. What does sign need to be? Is it zero to two pi? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, let me check times, real quick. Uh, does libm have once? No. Uh, what is it? It's F32. Uh, yeah, 2 pi is its period. Uh, libcore does depend on libm uh, physics. So, yeah. Um, where is Rust? Uh, uh, pi constant. Where does that actually live? And I'm but not, it is true so that I don't... it's not as good as LLVM's built-in stuff. It's also true. It's more cool. cons it's more concerned about making it work at all than it is about being the most efficient possible thing. Uh, it'd be core F32 const pi, I think. That? I'm missing another parentheses again. No. I'm really happy that Russ added the tau constant finally. <laughs> I, I, I am sort of curmudgeonly not happy, but it's fine. <laughs> it's like, it's all the same. It's just a different number. I'm sure the comments are going to blow up with that now. Oh, you know? re real hot takes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see if I can run this. No, errors. Expected one of eight possible tokens. That sounds a lot like my Syntax error. Limiters are unclosed. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, it's the ones at the end again. 
Oh, parentheses are so hard. <laughs> I know, right? We're not even doing a lisp right now. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Oh. That's an interesting. Is it? Huh. Oh, that's different. Uh, I wonder if uh, when I pressed that, hold on, I need to close this. I screw it's something up. The data Appears not to be connected. Okay, so we're going to unplug this. I'm going to plug this back in. Something I finally think... went wrong. This is great. <laughs> Development kit seems not to be connected. Uh... <laughs> Still uh, flashing at you too, which is like the best. No supported <laughs> probe. Oh, I bet you I know what's up. I bet you I'm using too much power here and it's browning out my microcontroller. Oh. Because that's the other thing is this USB will only supply one amp. Um, oh. And these LEDs can draw more than an amp. So let's... Uh, let's... Dial it down? I bet you these are, uh, yeah. It's kind of wild that like, like you don't really think about it all the time when like you're doing like higher level desktop programming or whatever because like oh power draw is just like not a thing you have to worry about because you usually have like yeah. a thousand two hundred watt like power thing in your like desktop or like whatever and so you're like what power you use who cares about that and oh <laughs> it's still apparently. 1.5 is still enough to, uh... yeah, the problem when you have them all on, they're all drawing power. It's usually fine as long as not all of them are drawing power. Also, if I wasn't lazy and actually connected this just through the, um, like, I have external 5-volt power supplies, but uh, I didn't connect them. I'm just, like, using the USB voltage. So it's actually probably my computer being like, that's too much power disconnect the usb device or something like that yeah trying to pre Let's... prevent you from burning your apartment down or whatever <laughs> or maybe it's just uh does it not like the float stuff i'm doing am i panicking yeah, i'm wondering if it's complaining handling? about like not being able to read this like data read write register thing so, yeah, which seems like a panicky kind of thing. Yeah. I wonder if I'm just like panicking in float code or something like that. Like if I'm handing right. the wrong thing and then it's just setting. Uh, well, have you tried bin formatting the. <laughs> Although when I unplug, when I unplug the. Yeah, let's try that. Um, I can't remember if we've implemented float parsing in a uh, bin format yet, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah. let's, uh, what do I want? I want to take, um, oh boy. <laughs> See, this is why I don't trust myself with F32s. Yeah. So one one of one of my favorite floating point things is uh, in the Serde YAML crate. Um, they have a value type, and you can use floating points as part of YAML. But yeah. they, in order to implement um, EQ, so that they could do equality, <laughs> it doesn't work with floating points. So mm. they implemented a whole thing where like oh here's how you do the here's how you do eq for everything and then for floating point or for the hashing specifically so they had to do eq and then they had to do hashing so that they could put it inside like a hash map uh thing and then they were like f32 equals three <laughs> and then it said you should feel bad if you're using f32 as a key in a hash map <laughs> no Good format info is not happy about well now it is Oh. Yeah, it was because uh, it was after I was casting it to a U8, and it's like that's not a that's not an F32 at all. It's like, how dare you? So, oh, I mean, it's going way over what it's supposed to be going, which is interesting. Yeah, so I bet I she was probably, probably panicking why. on 
float to you. Oh, it's, there's a 300 it's... there. Yeah, I'm seeing 300. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So yeah, the cast to 255, it's panicking because it's trying to go over bigger than a U8. What is... Why? Why is that more? Right. Than the question is, why is it doing that? What terrible Ooh. math thing have I done? Why are you using divide instead of oh. modulo? Well, yeah, it's divide instead of modulo. That's probably part of it. But it's also you're doing the Where? divide before Ooh. you pass it to the sign, not like after, right? So does that mean the value? Well, because I'm normalizing out? this. I'm normalizing this. Oh, the sign F is supposed to be. Yeah, this is parentheses gone wrong again. <laughs> I'm supposed to be normalizing. Who lets me write parentheses? So the count as <laughs> this is supposed to be inside of the, or really like, I want to normalize this between zero and one. And then you want to multiply it by pi times two. I want to multiply it by two pi. And so this should be the, stop giving me squigglies. I want to see where my parentheses actually are. <laughs> um, Cause I want, sign f to be on this essentially okay let's try this it's already active we'll terminate it <laughs> i finally got my desire for a terribly broken program Ooh, a negative well, one now that's good <laughs> No, that's good because we're doing like one quarter of this. Yeah. Oh no, wait, okay. sign of course it goes negative. Yeah. Oh, uh, because this is lib m. Hey, look, these extra uh parentheses are good for stuff. Fabs f. Float abs f. Or float oh, abs float. Absolute. So it takes yeah. a float and gives you back a float. And does the absolute value of it. Hello, yes. Did you terminate? Please now unterminate. We've got buff strings. We got floats with abs. Oh right, it's lib M abs. <laughs> now this is getting more into my like typical stream, which is just watch James yeah. uh, around with futz stuff. with futz around with with uh, compilation errors that he shouldn't have. Oh, I mean, it's super helpful. People, when I'm writing my stuff on stream too, it's always everybody else tripping in and saying like, hey, you forgot that thing there. Oops. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the best way, like I learn mostly from failures. So seeing people like kind of like not able to line things up is kind of like good in my yeah, opinion. Good. I, will, I probably have to go in like five minutes because two hours is like, is like pretty much my limit of my voice and stuff. So sure let me see if i can get a a beautiful sine wave going and then we'll uh that's probably a good time to wrap up yeah let's see if we can get yeah okay stop on yeah some people are saying in the chat that we need to add one because in like the fabs is gonna yeah i don't know well, this will do like a double bump. I could just do add one and then I think it would work, but I don't know why. And also my computer, I think is starting to revolt against. Yeah, okay, so now we are bouncing correctly. So now let's stop and let's now take. Woo. Uh, this. And let's uncomment this. I want to try and do this without breaking everything. This. And don't let me forget to change the colors at the beginning. Yeah. Or, although it doesn't matter right now with white, I would suppose. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Can we do it? <laughs> Trumbull. <laughs> not found in scope because right, I got rid of my logging beat. thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, the normal unwinding the hacks after you figured out why you needed hacks process. Oh, uh, what a big mood. Well, I've lost it like my... It's doing it. Yeah, I've lost my like UI. Oh, I'm full screened, right? There we go. Oh, sick. Okay. Yeah, totally. 
And then I just need to get rid of that 25%. So I, I think, stop it. <laughs> I, I don't know if the power is enough to make it brown out. Well, let's, let's we'll find keep out. It. Well, well, yeah. I mean, we're like end of the stream. And then like, let's change this to, uh, what's, what's a good, I was gonna say what color has all three colors in it. And that is white. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Let's go to 60% and we'll wrap up on that. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. There we go. We've got oh, a beautiful okay. sine wave fade. Pulse. That's sick. It's a double pulse. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that is enough to wrap us up for today. So I want to thank both of you for coming along and sharing some history and experience and playing with LEDs with me. Yeah. Um, right, yeah. yeah. Thank you for having anything me. You, uh, anything you guys want to say before we wrap up for the day? No, just thanks for coming and hanging out. It's tons of fun. Um, yeah, I'm doing streaming on Tuesdays, maybe more often. So uh, if you want to see me write some code, then uh, you can swing with my Twitch on Tuesday nights. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The stuff is cool and fun, and hopefully it all gets even better, and we have more good resources for people learning embedded stuff, and like this grows as an area for doing Rust stuff. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and I'll probably start streaming a little bit more. Um, but probably not next week because uh, unfortunately I have I'm on call all week, so I might be woken up at three a.m. Um, yeah. And so, but yeah, like afterwards probably. Um, and thanks for having me. I kind of actually got to learn something, and it was really interesting to see that there was like no unsafe and just like it's we've gotten to the point that like these abstractions exist and like makes it more user friendly, which I'm very happy about. So I might get my own board and start messing around with things and try it out myself. Very cool. Yeah. And thanks everyone for watching. Uh, I stream irregularly. Um, I basically, whenever I have time, I usually just hop on stream and program stuff. Uh, but if you're interested in this, feel free to check it out. I do stream on this YouTube channel, so feel free to subscribe. If you're interested in the logging and graphing stuff, the bin format stuff, definitely check out the Nerling RS repository. We just put out a blog post about what we're trying to do with that. So check out the fair systems blog. Um, I've tweeted about it a bunch, but we're we're attempting to build more cool tools like this in open source so that people have all the tools they want and need to make embedded Rust kind of the easiest and most powerful way to develop embedded systems and to do a lot of training and teaching and uh, those kind of things. So I'll probably talk about those more later, but I think we're planning on having guided tour example kinds of things where everyone's using the same hardware for a couple of weeks at a time and we walk you through how to do an LED strip, how to do a robot that has arms that wave around, how to have a little speaker that can play songs and things like that. So the goal is to get everyone on the same hardware and then have guided materials and stuff like that to, to teach people. So if you enjoyed this kind of format and want to do the same thing at your house, definitely check out the Nerling RS stuff. That's K-N-U-R-L-I-N-G, which is another wonderful pun from Ferris Systems in terms of putting an easy handle on uh, bare metal rust. So I think that's enough plugs for me. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you to both the guests and hopefully we'll get to do this again soon. Bye. Okay, see you later. See y'all later.